Derek, over the last week or so, three different Republican senators have come forward who have called into question either the capacity of President Trump to continue in office or his the general veracity of this president, Bob Corker, John McCain, and Jeff Flake. Jeff Flake of Arizona is the most recent one. With these three, in addition to the 48 Democratic senators, there are now more than 50 people in the Senate, currently serving in the Senate, who really do call this president's fitness for office into question. Is this something you should worry about? Yeah, so this this raises the specter of impeachment once again, uh, because if you do the math, like you said, we have a simple majority that potentially think he is unable to discharge the duties of a president. And this is uh, the territory of the 25th Amendment. Uh, motions could be made to actually impeach him. There aren't a lot of historical examples of impeachment. Uh, you got Andrew Johnson, uh, Richard Nixon, and and Bill Clinton. And we actually talked with two Richard Nixon experts uh, several, several episodes ago, and I think it became relevant again. So we should take a listen to see what the roadmap is to actually impeach Donald Trump. And then also, you know, talk about what it's really going to take if and when there's no real effort made to impeach this president, as unlikely as I think you and I both agree that it will be. But at the end of the episode, we're going to come back. We're going to do a brand new mail time. So stick around, listen to what we had to say about impeachment, and we'll see you at the end of the episode. In the wake of everything we're going through as a country and the Trump administration is going through the surreptitious tape recordings, the suspect firings of government officials and the like. The inclination, Derek, is to draw parallels between obviously the administration of Richard Nixon and the administration of Donald Trump. And those parallels, I think, extend not just to the president's actions, but also to the men themselves. Well, I see the essential parallel, one of uh, temperament. Uh, Both of them uh, rage. um, uh, Both of them see themselves as being victims. Uh, They won the game of, uh, if you think about the game of life, I mean, they're winners. They both entered the the Oval Office. They have the most powerful position in the world. And yet they seem to feel that they're victims and that there are are enemies out there that are seeking to deprive them or deny them of what is uh, what is their just desserts, if you will. That's Tim Naftali. He's the former director of the Nixon Presidential Library and professor of, among many other things, presidential history at New York University. But I'd like to focus on, on what I perceive to be the actual dissimilarities between the two men. Richard Nixon has this ha, has this reputation as one of the most calculating, maybe if you're, if you're not a fan, sort of Machiavellian impulses. I don't see Donald Trump as nearly as impressive. It, it, could this cut in his favor in sort of batting this stuff back, that he's an outsider, not such an insider as Richard Nixon was, so that he's not actually a, a puppeteer of a, of a grand cover-up, but actually just someone who's sort of feeling his way out and couldn't really form the criminal intent uh, necessary to, to be impeached. You have to ask a question, which is that Donald Trump has worked with lawyers all his uh, professional life. How is it not, how, how hasn't any of this rubbed off on him? Why is he so careless with his use of words? Why would he approach the head of a, of a law enforcement agency and even imply a willingness to interfere in an ongoing investigation? I mean, after all the years in New York, um, he hasn't learned that he should be careful <laughs> right. about what he says. So some of that argument, yet yes, he's an outsider, yeah, that works, but some of it doesn't. Right. There's, a level, there's an issue of competence here. He may, this may be his first time in a political rodeo. But this is not his first time in a rodeo. It's not the first time that he's had to worry about legal implications of his words or his actions. So this opinion that's expressed by Professor Neftali that Donald Trump may be more sophisticated or at least should be more sophisticated than maybe we give him credit for is something that is shared by other historians. Here's John Farrell, Nixon's biography, the author of Nixon, A Life, talking about this very same issue. Well, there's two possibilities when you look at Donald Trump's uh, personality. One is that this is all just Trump being Trump. He's just this uh, um, uh, baby Huey who, who is <laughs> sophisticated in the ways of, of Washington, and he's spouting things out that uh, other politicians, career politicians, uh, would know to stay away from. And it's, 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 it's even somewhat charming that we have this amateur in, in, the, uh, in the White House who can just you know, be himself. But the flip side of that is that Donald Trump is a man in his uh, uh, eighth decade who has uh, climbed the very slippery media pole in New York City and and uh, the, the the world of casinos and and development. This is this is no neophyte, and it's quite possible that uh, this sort of aw shucks 
uh, Trumpian uh, bluster. Um, this is his thing. This is you know the way that Nixon was cunning in in his way. This is the way that that Trump is cunning his own way. So that he says things and then they're brought up and he sort of shrugs and waves his hand in the in the air and says, oh you know that was locker room talk. And everybody goes, oh you know. You know, he, the old Don, he's, you know, uh, the Donald. So there's this temptation to see Trump as a, a political neophyte, but I, I actually think that does him a bit of a disservice. And remember, Trump is a guy who's sophisticatedly navigated the New York business scene for years. He became a billionaire, and just recently he pulled off one of the largest electoral upsets in history, Jason. Yeah, and Farrell and Atali, both in their writings and what they said here, sort of focus quite a bit on this quickness to rage, this impulsiveness that Donald Trump has, whether it be the firing of James Comey or he's lashing out at the press. But really, that's just sort of the tip of the Donald Trump iceberg. He, you know, we had this event earlier this week where he, uh, where he was accused of leaking information, confidential, highly classified information to the Russian ambassador that could compromise, arguably, the Democrats say, and, and Trump denies this wholeheartedly, as do the Israelis, as have the Russians come out and denied this as well, that compromises not only our security, but also our existing relationship with key allies. How much stock do you put in that? How much weight do you put in the fact that these leaks could, in fact, be detrimental to the counterterrorism effort? Uh, well, I would really... Um the president has the authority to share uh, classified information with foreign governments. Yep. Uh, what, what Donald Trump did, which was highly questionable and, and probably a big mistake, was to, was to share information from another country with a third party. Um, the U.S. has very extensive intelligence-sharing relationships with many countries around the world, and those are based on trust. And they're based on the assumption that you're not going to share that information without the prior approval of the country that gave it to you. That's the part of the story that's so troubling. Whether this imperils uh, the source or not, I mean, that would be troubling, too. But I, I don't know enough about exactly what was shared. Um, I think, though, that, it, that there's reason enough to be concerned and, and disappointed in the president simply because he shared another country's secret information. That's not up to him to do. He can share his own. He can share our government's inter information, but he can't share somebody else's without their approval. So in the, in the face of everything, Derek, Donald Trump really took a defiant stand. For the first time, he spoke out about many of these allegations during a commencement address at the Coast Guard Academy. And he, re again, he took a really defiant stage and stated that he is the most unfairly treated politician in world history. A remarkable statement. It, it really is. I mean, I, I think Slate put this best. They had a headline that said, in, in effect, that Donald Trump calls himself the most unfairly treated president in history, comma, ignores everyone who was murdered, <laughs> which I thought just put it, such a fine point on it. <laughs> right. Uh, yeah. So, go ahead. Yeah. So but despite him digging in his heels here, uh, you know, where does this leave the president? Uh, obviously, the appointment of Robert Mueller as special counsel to conduct a wide-ranging investigation into Trump's dealings with Russia during the campaign brings the possibility of impeachment really into focus. Uh, the allegations are now approaching um, Watergate-type allegations. If you look at the, the big difference is that Richard Nixon had a very hostile Democratic Congress, and Donald Trump has a somewhat compliant Republican uh, Congress. And if you really go down the road and think that this thing plays all the way out, you need 67 votes in the United States Senate to convict, which is why Bill Clinton got off, even though he was impeached by the House of Representatives in 1996. That's a big nut. But, Tim Natale, even if the president is found to have done something wrong, and that, that's obviously a big if. We've got a long way to go. Impeachment is, a, in, impeachment is obviously a long political process. Uh, in Nixon's case, the Watergate break-in took place in June of 1972, but he didn't resign. And had he not resigned, it could have gone on for years longer, honestly, throughout his presidency, probably. Uh, he didn't resign until Oct August of 1974, well over two years later. Do you really see impeachment as a plausible scenario in the case of Donald Trump? I'm a historian. I'm terrible at making predictions. I got the 2016 election wrong. I think we let all did. Let me tell you, but no, no, but, I, but I'm not ducking this, okay? Right. Let me tell you what you're watching, looking for. What you're looking for over the next uh, few weeks or months, one, is, more, is first of all, what, did, what kinds of records did Comey keep? Two, does he testify under oath and, and, and confirm, I think he would, but confirm these records and do we see them? Uh, then it's Comey versus the president. Um, how does Donald Trump react? Does he overreact? Does he start making more mistakes? Um, do we see people uh, resigning from the White House? 
And as his poll numbers, if his poll numbers continue to drop, do we see members of Congress who are concerned about 2018 starting to really distance themselves from him and thus lead to a discussion of perhaps this is not the right job for this man? That's what we're looking for. So, Derek, we, we have the historical context for all of this. We know what the precedents are. But let's drill down on the, uh, on the memos here, on the allegation that Donald Trump tried to influence James Comey into dropping the investigation against Flynn. All of the talks about obstruction of justice. What does the law tell us? Where are we really? Is this obstruction of justice that he can be prosecuted for and potentially impeached for or much ado about nothing? So let's let's start with the law. So there's a statute that is directly on point for obstruction of justice. It's 18 U.S.C. 1505. And it states in relevant part that there's a crime if you, quote, corruptly or by threats of force or by any threatening letter or communication influence, obstruct or impede or endeavor to influence, obstruct, or impede an open investigation. Right. Now, we can quibble over uh, sort of the semantics here, but a superior, which Trump was to Comey, suggesting that an investigation be dropped, you could see that as influence, right, Jason? Or at least endeavoring to push the, the, the investigation in a certain he, manner. Here's the thing, and there's a great difficulty with prosecuting obstruction of justice claims, and that is you have to get into the head of the person who made the comment. Because remember, the, the, it's important, the most important word in that statute is corruptly endeavors or corruptly uh, intimidates or corruptly suggests or corruptly influences. To be corrupt, it, it suggests a mental state of the person speaking. And without knowing what the mental state of the president was there, was he just talking out loud? How much you can, can you divine, and can you divine it beyond a reasonable doubt, that he did it with the intent to corrupt the investigation into this person, therefore did it corruptly? But I think, you know, so that's And it's the hard with Trump. Trump is a loose, bloviating, blustery type figure. He could just be talking out loud or he could be trying to abuse his power. We don't really know with him. He does both in different contexts, right? He, he, he sure does. But, you know, here we're beyond, we're sort of past the legal definition of obstruction of justice. We're into the political one, right? Because we all know that the a president can be impeached and there's no judicial review on that. We always look at this high crimes and misdemeanors. Has a high crime been committed? Has a misdemeanor been, been committed? That's up to interpretation. And really, who's it to interpret that? The members of the House of Representatives and the members of the Senate, ultimately, are the ones that will ultimately decide whether or not he committed this, not a judge who has to look at the letter of the statute. Yeah, that's exactly right. Even though we call it conviction by the Senate, conviction, there is no court proceeding at all with impeachment. Right. Uh, it, it, it takes place totally, totally between the houses of Congress, and it, the conviction arm of it is run like a trial, but it's done by politicians, which right. is very different it, than judges. It is a totally political calculation of whether or not enough members of the House and enough members of the Senate want to declare this to be a high crime or a misdemeanor, and a misdemeanor is pretty pretty low crime, right? Right, right. Uh, and whether or not they, they choose to impeach and then convict him of the, of the charges of obstruction of justice. And, and as you said, if you're upset about the outcome, there's nowhere you can look. I, I know no. Trump so, sort of has announced some contempt for our judges, so-called judges and things like that. He they're says irrelevant that to this But procedure. there's nowhere to look. After you're impeached, it's over. So, Derek, given, given everything that we learned, you know, what do you think the real odds likelihood of impeachment are? I think what's different about then and now is there's a true schism in the party. People have left and abandoned Donald Trump, who are Republicans. They're no longer saying, look, let's get what we can out of him. If he wants to do a silly wall, at least we can push through certain types of reforms. There are people who have abandoned that and said, I no longer want to rally behind this guy. And I think once you have those numbers, you really have a chance of impeachment. You do, but, but it, it won't be based on principle. And this is not an attack on the right because the left is just as bad when it comes to this. But each individual member of the House and member of the Senate is protecting their own hide. And for right now, we're still a year away from next year's elections. When next year's elections get closer, if there's a true effort by the left to retake the Senate and potentially retake the House, and we, they think that's viable. You're going to see more and more Republicans have to abandon this president to attack more to the middle. If that, and believe me, they will. We, we, what we have seen over the last certainly couple of years and then the eight years or 16 years before that is that there's no real allegiance to policy. It is to party and to oneself. And so if they feel that their party's going to go down in defeat and they themselves may lose, they are going to attack against this president. And that may, in fact, I think result in impeachment. I don't think it's going to happen in the near term, but I do see in 8 to 12 months a real rallying cry among scared Republicans that maybe this is the way to go. Yep. What's that sound? And who the hell is this new guy over there? Sound from Mailtime, guys. Hey, it's hey. Maddie, everyone. Yeah, yeah. Welcome, filling Maddie. In, filling in for Parker, who we never really liked anyway. <laughs> oh, no, we Good love, riddance. We love Parker. Uh, so make sure to mail in your questions at Behind the Bar at 
TMZ.com. We have a couple questions today. First, Jesse says, I saw the video of a fan at the Harry Styles concert reaching up and grabbing his genitals while he was performing on stage. Isn't this sexual assault, and could the person be arrested? You bet it's sexual assault. So what happened was Harry Styles was performing on stage. He got up in the, you know, very close to the first uh, row of the audience, the, you know, on one of these sort of peninsula stages that goes out into the audience. And a fan, he couldn't see who it was, but you see their hand jut up and actually, like, cup his entire junk, right? And he reacted really quickly, brushed the hand away, and then walked away from the, from the fans. Clearly non-consensual. Clearly Harry Styles non-consensual. pushes the hand right. away. Despite the fact he was gyrating in the faces of the people in the first row, at no point can anybody, any reasonable person think, hey, uh, you know, he wants me to grab their junk. That's right. Now, this is in stark contrast to what R. Kelly does at his concerts, where he moves up and invites women to touch his genitals. He and gyrates. He invites them back to a home in Atlanta somewhere where he, you know, keeps them for that, some time. <laughs> that's right. But we see this all the time, right? We've yep. seen it with. Uh, recently with Beyonce, I think we saw somebody grab her. Jason Aldean, we saw somebody reach Jason up and Aldean, grab, we definitely grab saw. her, uh, gra- gra- grab him. So it happens from time. What do you think? Is there a legitimate prosecution available for sexual assault for these folks? I don't think you're going to see it. I don't think he's. I don't think Harry Styles would ever push a case against right. against a, a fan, fan right. who is reaching out excitedly to touch him. Uh, could there be? Could there be a case? It's non consensual touching. There's certainly uh, the intent to grab him. I think you have enough of the elements to to bring a case. But I don't think you'd ever see something like. Like that the, the the pushback would be the, the one extreme. case that I would see it in is if it's a male fan doing it to a female artist and that if that female artist has been sort of outspoken you know a critic of sexual harassment everybody is or sexual assault everybody is a, a critic of that but somebody who's really been outspoken on these issues I can see uh, you know that that some male a Taylor fan Swift maybe does it to a Taylor Swift for example perfect example yeah. given that she sued somebody for sort of a semi incidental grabbing of of her butt. Um, she sued that person. So if somebody would come along and sexually assault her, she should and frankly, I mean, could and frankly, maybe should go after that person yep. and have to see them prosecuted to the extent possible. All right. Next up, Melissa wrote in the Kardashians are getting 150 million from E for five more seasons. And TMZ said it's all broken down about which family member gets what amounts. But you never talked about the little kids on the show. Do they get paid and aren't there laws to stop the parents from getting their money? Good question. What, what Very good there? question. So yeah, the huge deal, 150 million. That's the that's the top line number. But what we don't know is how it's divvied up. We know that there are side contracts that exist that uh, distribute the money amongst the Kardashians and the Jenners, but we don't know the exact amounts. But there are a lot of kids now, so we should see some minors contracts that are filed because minors have to have their their contracts approved by the court. Well, one thing, number one, they have to be paid. You can't not oh, pay the kids for appearing on, on, on this show, right? So that, that's one thing. And number two, you can't pay them without what's called a minor's contract. And we see these all the time. We report on them, right? That's exactly right. So when, when, when a minor has a contract, their parents have to sign off on it, and you also need a judge's approval. And the reason for this is back in the day, children used to be taken advantage of. Like Jackie Coogan? Jackie Coogan was famous, the, the little boy in the movies with Charlie Chaplin. He later was Uncle Fester in the Adams, Adams family. Uh, his parents basically stole all of his money. Yeah. And so to protect them, laws were put in place where you have what's called Coogan accounts, and they basically segregate about 15% of his earnings to make sure that it's in an account that can't be touched by the parents. That's right. So when when Jackie Coogan and now when all kids grow up, they'll have some of that, uh, that there because you can see... You know, parents, you know, at some point either feel entitled to the money that the kid is earning because they're working very hard on behalf of the kid, or they just need it. And there's this pile of pool of money that they want to access. So court set up these Coogan accounts. The money has to be paid directly from the studio into the Coogan account, and the parents may not touch that money. There's no access to it. I'll give you a little anecdote, actually. Those yeah. those are highly restricted accounts, and even if you accidentally deposit money into a Coogan account, uh, you can't get that money out oh, is that a right? court order. Yeah, my so wife if you just took up the wrong deposit slip and put money in there? And put money Money into that account, you need to go to court and have them release the money from the Coogan account. That's how, even if it's an incidental mistake, you have to go to court. The Coogan accounts are a one-way street. You were about to tell a story about your wife involved in this. I yeah, she know. actually had to release was money she for a one trial of her. Star? No, no. Is well, your one wife of, Shirley Temple? Is my wife. Is, <laughs> my wife is the late great Shirley Temple. <laughs> you just you crack the code. There's, uh, but she actually had to go to court, and it, it was released. You go to family court, and you can reverse these things. But it's actually uh, oh, a, you got very. You got to spend a lot of money. So you better hope there's a lot of money there to be released. Married doesn't come cheap. <laughs> <laughs> in any respect. <laughs> <laughs> and on that note, uh, thanks very much for tuning in, everybody. We will be back next week with another very exciting addiction. Adip- uh, another addition. exciting addiction <laughs> to I'll this behind, podcast. Up behind the bar. Thanks very much. Thanks. Thanks for watching. If you want more nerdy deep dives into the legal side of celebrity news, hit our subscribe button right here. And check out our previous episodes over here. <laughs>